Oké, okay, iedereen binnen? Oké, okay, welkom uh, everybody to uh, uh, this uh, workshop Sprinkler Protection for Personal Safety. Uh, we know Sprinkler Protection for, uh, let's say, controlling the fire, uh, preventing uh, fire propagation. Uh, and uh, uh, then the question raises that maybe Sprinkler could also be very uh, useful uh, to uh, make a more safe environment for building users and have any impact on personal safety. So uh, uh, we're doing that together. That means we did separately uh, research uh, for uh, sprinkler protection for personal safety. Um, let me introduce myself first. Maybe that's not the right way, but. <laughs> uh, Ruud van Herpen. I'm uh, normally uh, 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 a technical director at uh, Niemann Consultants. That's my main job. And I'm also uh, one day a week uh, what they call a fellow uh, at the Eindhoven University of Technology, fellow in fire engineering, and, and also professor of fire safety of buildings at uh, Saxion University of Applied Sciences. So I have uh, different hats, and uh, my hat now is uh, Eindhoven. <laughs> uh, well, no, not, not totally, because uh, the research that I present is done by, uh, by Niemann, by, by my colleagues at Niemann. Uh, so it's a, like a kind of, of combined research project. Maybe you introduce yourself, yeah. uh, Simon? Yeah, I can do that. Thank you, Rune. So good afternoon on my behalf as well. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Simo Hostikka. I come from Aalto University in, in Finland. Aalto is a fairly new university, basically built on top of uh, Helsinki University of Technology, which you may have heard uh, being existing before. Uh, I, before joining Aalto about six years ago, I worked as a researcher, fire researcher at VTT, Technical Research Center of Finland, mainly focusing on fire simulation, FTS development, fire risk analysis, mainly in nuclear field and so on. So now for six years I've been working as a associate professor of fire safety engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering in, at Aalto. And uh, we ended up doing this study or a session together with Ruud basically uh, already last year we noticed that we have similar, similar research to topics. Yeah. Last year it was about pressure yeah. This year, it turned out that we have both been looking at the effect or, or benefit of sprinklers for the personal safety. So next, Ruud will uh, introduce us to the topic. Basically, we try to get you uh, discuss, maybe vote a little bit. And then after that, uh, he will present his own research. I will present mine. And then we try to get uh, some conclusions from the big picture. Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. So uh, yeah, we also want to know your opinion because I think uh, if you want to talk about benefits of sprinkler protection for personal safety, then you have to define what you think is, uh, w well, what, what we mean with personal safety, with human safety. And uh, so that's this question about, uh, and um, well, there are several options. You can think about life safety, just surviving a fire. So no matter what kind of health damage, but you survive a fire, uh, that's a, a certain safety level. Uh, you can also say, well, nay, that, that, that's, that's um, uh, I, I like to be more sure about safety. So instead of life safety, I. I think personal safety is related to health safety. That means that uh, the probability of, uh, of injuries caused by a smoke layer, caused by the fire, is very low. Or you can say, no, it's related to evacuation, because evacuating uh, a fire room is basically the concept of, of most building codes. I want to be safe in case of fire. That means that I have to evacuate. So. Um, uh, a low probability of evacuation failure, uh, egress safety. Uh, may maybe that is what we mean with personal safety. Um, or is it just sufficient visibility for evacuation so I can find my way out? Uh, uh, regardless what temperatures, what smoke conditions are, just visibility. Or is it even something else? So maybe, um, 
we, 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 can, we can see what, what, what you think is uh, the best definition for personal safety just by hand raising. Maybe that's, that's the option that we can do. Uh, and then let's start with option one, uh, uh, life safety. Who thinks that's well, most let, related? Let's ask in a way, in your work, how you have, uh, you have, how, how you have been used to think as, as personal safety. Not, 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 no, not think here as, as what is the ultimate way, but think about your background and how you were educated, how you are used to think. Yeah. So, and we can actually combine, combine maybe one and two together. It's like probability of lethal or yeah. injuries. Yeah. So, so how many of you are used to think about personal safety as an attempt or capability of the building to avoid the loss of life in, or the, or the, in terms of probability? Okay. There are few, 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 few hands. And, and how many of you think, are used to think personal safety as a, as a success of evacuation? And, and those well, of that's, you, that's, yeah, less. that's less. That's less yeah. I was yeah. expecting the other way around. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, I'm, I think I was <laughs> expecting this a bit, but, okay. but you see that in the... Yeah, sorry. You see that in the building code, it's the other way around, because the building code is especially, especially here in Holland, and uh, I think in Finland too, is related to evacuation safety. So uh, we want to evacuate uh, from a dangerous place to a safe place. And, and uh, so if you take the building code uh, into your mind, then I think the third option is, comes, comes most close to the building code. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Okay, who? Something else. Yeah, something else. What, what is something else in your opinion? Uh, you have to speak in the, in the mic because it's uh, recorded. If I think of uh, health safety, uh, I think of uh, a recoverable injury, so no permanent injury. That's uh, uh, a refinement on the yeah. number two. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah, okay, yeah. That's a question. No, that, uh, that's a matter of definition. Uh, you, you think, well, maybe we, we should. <laughs> Uh, we should just make, make a difference between permanent injuries and injuries that can recover. But in both cases, uh, we need medical care. And, uh, okay. Something, you think also some, something else? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think the building code still focus on life safety. But what, I mean, I'm a fire engineer now, but as fire engineers, we use e egress safety as a means to judge whether our design fulfills the requirement of life safety. So it's, life safety is the goal, but the tool we use is egress safety. Right. That's yeah. what I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I think you, you may be right. Life safety is the goal, and um, you see in building codes that that goal is too abstract, so we need, uh, uh, let's say, risk subsystems to, uh, to fulfill that goal. and. Egress safety, evacuation is one of those subsystems. Yeah, yeah, that might be, that might be true. Yeah. Okay. Something else. Someone else who wants to add something about <laughs> this discussion? Yeah. Okay. May, um, well, um, uh, I have uh, three slides uh, about uh, assessment criteria that that we can use when we uh, talking about egress safety. Uh, so. Okay, let's say it's only a risk sub subsystem, but in most building codes, it's, uh, it's an important uh, risk system. Uh, and that means that we have to define what we think is uh, uh, acceptable, uh, what are acceptable boundary conditions for the environment uh, to, let's say, to, to make safe evacuation possible. And um, that, de well, in most cases, it depends uh, on the time that you need for evacuation. So what you, hear, what you see here uh, are very strict uh, boundary conditions uh, because uh, we here uh, have an infinite exposure time. And that means that you are basically safe in that place for a long time uh, without any health damage. Uh, I made the difference between a stratified situation, so that means a two-zone situ situation, a hot zone uh, underneath the ceiling and, and underneath the hot zone, a cold zone. Uh, and a mixed situation, and yeah, 
well, of course, there is a lot in between uh, those two situations, but that are the two extreme situations that you can encounter. And, um, well, in a certified situation, at least I need a smoke-free height, uh, because I, 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 uh, it, it must be possible to walk underneath the smoke layer uh, to, uh, well, to an exit or whatever. So, well, you can discuss if that has to be two meter or two and a half meter, but two and a half meter is most commonly used, I think. And um, uh, yeah, well, the only thing that might be dangerous from the smoke layer is the radiation flux. Uh, there is convective temperature, pollution is of no importance because that's all in the smoke layer. And you are not in the smoke layer, but you are uh, under the smoke layer. So the radiation flux uh, caused by the temperature of the smoke layer, uh, that might be an issue that you have to take into account. And um, well, a radiation flux of one kilowatt per square meter is really a very safe condition uh, that you can withstand without any health damage for a long time. Uh, so, so that's a, a set of criterion that you can use for the stratified situation. And for the mixed situation, yeah, uh, then of course important is the gas temperature, uh, maybe also important uh, the toxicity of the smoke, uh, but um, for an infinite exposure time, uh, yeah, you really want uh, uh, to to uh, well uh, to 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 have a, lo a lo long visibility, <coughs> and uh, uh, so that means that um, temperatures are very low. Visibility of a hundred meter, yeah, that's that's really uh, it's only a little bit foggy. It's not more than that. So uh, that's uh, that's that's also very strict conditions. Um, uh, you, I, th I think uh, you also find sometimes boundary conditions like visibility of 30 meters. Uh, maybe that's acceptable too for infinite exposure time. But with that kind of visibility, it means that the optical density of the smoke uh, is, uh, is very low. Uh, and, and that means that toxicity is not really an issue. I think you can say that. Don't you agree on that, uh, Simon? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, when. Uh, in most cases, we, uh, we use an, an escape route only for a short time, let's say for three, four or five minutes, something like that. Uh, and that means that an infinite exposure time is, is not really necessary. Um, so for a short exposure time, you can imagine that we can allow, uh, a, a, well, a bit higher conditions. Uh, uh, for radiation flux, for instance, instead of one kilowatt per square meter, uh, we very often use two and a half kilowatt per square meter because during five minutes, that means that in most cases we don't have any health damage, we don't have any skin blistering with that radiation flux for a short exposure time. The mixed situation it becomes a little bit more difficult, uh, especially a visibility of, uh, well, let's say more than five meter. Uh, I think then still toxicity is not <coughs> really an issue. Visibility is, is, is uh, let's say, a more strict criterion in this case than toxicity. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that is, uh, uh, and a gas temperature of 100 degrees Celsius uh, means that you can still find your way out through the smoke, that you can even inhale the smoke. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not nice, of course, but uh, it's possible to find your way out in that condition, uh, under those conditions. Um, okay, someone has to, wants to add something to this, because this is, uh, in my research, I also used these boundary conditions as assessment criterions for, for life safety and equal safety. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> there are people that inhale smoke and are already ill, and smoke is a yeah. uh, problem when you have uh, something with your lungs, etc. How does this uh, work with those people? But because they have to go through the mixed situation. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Now you ask like how if people with different tolerance yeah. actually inhale smoke so how should we consider that and now we start to talk about not a failure of egress but actually the available safe time yeah. if you have the next slide yeah. so when we consider the situation that people actually may be inside smoke and here inhaling it yeah. so we start to look at dose of toxic species or temperature or heat flux so what is the physical impact of smoke on a person 
and uh, in this concept we are not comparing egress time but available safe time how long a person can survive or stay without injury yeah and then we're talking now about non self reliant buildings yeah. for instance yeah. 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 and required safe time now depends on external and external organization how how long we need for instance to help a person out from the building and okay we can do the comparison in a similar way comparing the two times to come to your question can you have turn the next slide basically yeah. uh, the life safety uh, usually is determined or, or, or the toxic and temperature effects are measured using the fractional effective dose and fractional effective concentrations as calculated according to the ISO 13571 standard which mainly considers carbon monoxide and HCN as most influential and practically only important toxic species of fire situations and the standard then gives different uh, uh, thresholds basically value of FED1 means that 50 percent of the population which was actually animals would be incapacitated not death they would be incapacitated at this dose and then the question how more sensitive parts of the population like ill elderly people should be considered and so we have all the thresholds values. yes we can choose different threshold 0.3 FED is very common sometimes even 0.1 on the other hand the concept of FED from the first place is probabilistic it, it, it recognizes that okay one means 50 percent of population and then uh, kind of the variability of the population is already included but we all understand it's very difficult to say if the mice or rabbit or maybe uh, baboon population that was used in the experiment has a distribution of individuals anything similar to human distributions okay so I didn't answer your question, but just talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. So yeah. So we use this this criterion for uh, let's say when when uh, people are not self reliant anymore, and that means that visibility is not really an issue. Visibility is uh, with uh, w when we are calculating with uh, uh, fractional effective concentrations and effect fractional effective doses. Uh, that visibility uh, might even be less than one meter. That's, that's not, not an issue anymore. Uh, so then we really take a look into the uh, toxic components in the smoke. And uh, that's also what your research is about, I think, uh, Simo. Okay. Um, well, what you see here in background is uh, 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 the market hall in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, so that's a very large compartment with a very large fire load and a lot of people inside. Uh, so this is really a compartment where, you, where we, we are used to doing an A-set, R-set analysis. Available safe egress time, comparing with required safe egress time. And that's what this question is, uh, is about. Uh, does Sprinkler have an impact on personal safety of building occupants? Uh, there are basically, well, in this question, two possible answers. You say no, because uh, the available safe egress time is determined by limiting spread of smoke only. And uh, uh, yeah, sprinkler is, is basically meant for uh, uh, preventing fire propagation, uh, so it's not limiting the spread of smoke. Uh, if you answer this question with no, that means that the amount of smoke does not really matter. You say, well, smoke is toxic, smoke is hazardous, so I, uh, that, that, that is basically uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the argument for, for, for no. And if you say yes, uh, then you say, well, uh, the available safe time is uh, uh, also determined by limiting fire development because limiting fire development not only means 
preventing fire propagation, but also means that you are limiting the production of smoke. Uh, so the amount of smoke um, matters. Uh, that means that less amount of smoke might be uh, an advantage uh, for personal safety. So that two ways to answer no or yes. I'm, I'm just think well. Um, what 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 do you think? Who thinks well? No, sprinkler is is not meant for uh, creating safe conditions for evacuation. Uh, who thinks that that the answer could be no on this question? Yeah, you're all here because you think that the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, but but. Um, uh, in practice, we very often encounter this first opinion. Eh? There's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, and, and I can say that because I'm also a consulting engineer, and so I do a lot of projects. And uh, when I do projects with, with sprinkler protection in it, then sprinkler is never valued because of personal safety. They also all, every, eh? the, the, the assessor always says, well, no, you need to fulfill the, the walking distances, etc. It may not exceed the walking distance because sprinkler is only for creating large compartments or is only for reduction on uh, the fire resistance of your load-bearing elements or your separation constructions, but it's not meant for personal safety. I think that is, in general, the opinion. Do you, do you, don't you recognize that? In this case, uh, in the market hall. Yeah. <coughs> As soon as you uh, start sprinkling, you cool down the smoke, which means that it actually comes down. But if, if you didn't test uh, anything at all, it will go that high that there are no people. So for life safety, I would say leave off the sprinklers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, that that is um, that might be true eh, that the sprinkler droplets influence the smoke plume and have a negative influence on the smoke plume. That's true, of course. But the question is, is that influence that large that we get a mixed situation, a, di a totally different situation? Or uh, do we still have enough, uh, enough heat in the plume for, for, for rising the plume to, a, let us, let's say, a stratified situation? Well, maybe, maybe it's nice to, to uh, to go down to the research question, um, yeah, for <laughs> for my my part of the research, and uh, uh, because uh, I did uh, a lot of ASAT RSAT uh, analysis, uh, also in a probabilistic way, and that's basically the starting point. I did it also for the market hall in Rotterdam, but came to a little bit different conclusion than uh, the engineer who uh, was uh, uh, well, who was in charge for the fire engineering in the market hall. So I, I made a case that is uh, not directly related to the market hall. So it's a more generic, very simple market hall, as you see here, it's very, very large. It's uh, 10,000 square meters and uh, seven meters high. Um, so a very simple model. Um, and um, I'm in this presentation, I'm only looking at the available safe egress time. So I'm not uh, looking at the required safe egress time, but because uh, this is uh, in a, a sprinkler research and with a sprinkler uh, protection, you cannot influence the required safe time. You can only influence available safe time. So that's, that's why we here only focus on the available safe time. Um, Okay, so I uh, assumed a uniform distribution of fuel with, a, I think, a very, well, rather large fire load of 1,200 megajoules per square meter, a uh, rate of heat release um, uh, 500 kilowatt per square meter is also high, eh? so I think that that corresponds to the function of the market hall. Um, a time constant uh, fast, fast uh, that means a fast uh, fire development, a time constant of 150 seconds mean that in two and a half uh, minutes I have a one megawatt fire. Uh, so this is uh, what we call a T-squared design curve uh, that I use for, for, for the market hall. Uh, a plume according to the plume model of Heskestad, I think that corresponds b uh, best with uh, a cellulose kind of fire. Uh, and that also goes for the stoichiometric constant. That is the uh, amount of oxygen that is needed for one kilogram of fuel. So this is, I think, um, a little bit related to uh, our national annex to the Eurocode. There you find all uh, the same conditions for 
let's say, a supermarket and a building market. Uh, so I, I used those boundary conditions uh, 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 for uh, the fuel and the fire for this uh, market hall. And for the external separation constructions, I assumed that they were adiabatic uh, and no glass fallout during the pre flashover situation. And I think you can see that as a conservative assumption. Uh, that means that there is no uh, uh, loss of heat out of the gas mass to the environment, not to the outside environment and not to the constructions. Uh, so that means that all uh, heat remains in, all, all gas energy remains in, in the volume of, uh, of the market hall. Um, so here is, you find the um, assessment criteria that I used and you recognize them for uh, from the former slides, I think, so that means the radiation flux lower than two and a half kilowatt per square meter and a smoke-free height of at least two and a half meters um, in a stratified situation. Um, and I also calculated a mixed situation because you never know. Uh, I think with uh, the conditions that I took uh, that uh, a stratified situation is more likely than a mixed situation, but okay a gas temperature of uh, 100 degrees Celsius as a maximum and a visibility of at least five meters. Um, well, doing a, a probabilistic assessment, or uh, that means that we do a sensitivity analysis on stochastic boundary conditions, on all boundary conditions with uncertainty, uh, the kind of boundary conditions that we really don't know. And uh, yeah, basically all conditions related to fuel and fire are stochastic boundary conditions because uh, a t squared design curve means that we assume that is that curve, but with a lot of uncertainty around the curve. Um, well, so that means that for each stochastic boundary condition, I, uh, well, I, I gave you the mean value. You saw that on the former slides. We have to um, estimate the standard deviation for each boundary condition. And um, well, then we do a sensitivity analysis uh, for, for each boundary condition separately and varying it with its standard deviation. Um, well, this is a very technical sheet, I realize. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, but um, uh, at the end of, of the story is that when I did that sensitivity analysis, I can um, uh, uh, produce, uh, you could say, well, it stands for A set minus R set, but I can produce for the available safe equals time uh, uh, um, a probabilistic distribution function. So I ca can can I can show you then uh, uh, what is the probability that the A set, for instance, is one minute or two minutes or five minutes, whatever. Um, yeah, may maybe this. Okay, but um, okay, the the boundary conditions, the stochastic boundary conditions. Uh, that means the conditions with uncertainty in it. Um, what do you think are most important stochastic boundary conditions? So, and I mean with the question, uh, where do you think are the main uncertainties in what boundary conditions? Is that in the building characteristics? And I mean, uh, uh, be the uh, um, external separation constructions, uh, if are they insulated or not? Uh, uh, is, uh, 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 do we have a lot of uh, heat accumulation in the constructions, et cetera? Uh, a glass fallout or not, uh, that, that kind of things. Um, is it in sprinkler characteristics? Uh, so the response time index, for instance, activation temperature, that, that kind. Um, or is it in fire or fuel characteristics? That means uh, fire load, it means rate of heat release per unit area, uh, time constant, uh, so stoichiometric constant, uh, well, you can think about that kind of condition, or are there other characteristics uh, where we have to take into account a lot of uncertainty? Um, I think, I think in, in my opinion, it's very clear where, <laughs> where we uh, have to deal with the real stochastic boundary conditions. Um, but I'm, I'm also curious about your opinion um, okay, well, maybe, maybe by, by hand raising again, who thinks <coughs> building characteristics are, uh, well, there are a lot of uncertainties in building characteristics. And then you have to think about separation constructions, the volume of the compartment, etc. But do you mean for this particular case of 10,000 square meters? Yeah. Meters 
Yeah, yeah do, that, I think that's most simple. Do it for this particular case, yeah. And then it's what's around with the edge, edge bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, okay. <laughs> Everyone thinks no, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> in sprinkler characteristics, do we have to deal with a lot of uncertainties in sprinkler characteristics? Yeah? Uh, yeah? And why is that? What, what, what is an uncertainty in sprinkler characteristics? In the, the um, uh, particle size distribution, in this yeah. case uh, the droplets, okay. and um, <coughs> uh, the amount of water it can give uh, to the, the area. So you're talking about uh, how many liters per square meter per uh, uh, surface. And uh, whether it's uh, uh, a single state or a, uh, a two states or three states even uh, sprinkler installation. If you're talking about large buildings, yeah. you still think about uh, uh, a multiple state sprinkler. Okay, I agree. You can see that as uncertainties, but you can also see that as um, uh, design parameters. And a design parameter is something that you have in control. Uh, and and the stochastic boundary condition is something you don't have in control. Eh? So that's I think that's that's the difference. And what you don't have under control is especially the fi the fire. Uh, that's something you I'm don't know. About yeah. About yeah. Yeah. No, you're you're right with your answer. But but uh, uh, what 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 you don't have under control that is really what I mean in this case with stochastic boundary conditions. Eh? Uh, and the same goes for the, for the building characteristics. Basically, that's, that is a design parameter. So you, uh, you, you, you know how you design your building. You know what, what kind of materials you, you, you want to use. Uh, so so you, you can also change it if it's necessary. But uh, the fire or the fuel, you, you cannot change. Uh, it's depending on, on the building user, the, the kind of fuel that's inside. And uh, the fire, uh, yeah, yeah, you can think about that, everything. Uh, so that's that's... Uh, that I think they are the main stochastic boundary conditions are, are in, in uh, the fire characteristics. So I took, um, uh, here you see um, several um, yeah, uh, boundary conditions related to the fire, uh, like uh, fire load density, uh, rate of heat release per unit area, um, time constant for fire spread, and I also took into account the the start of the the, 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 the fire height at the, the start of the of the plume. Um, so um, what you see here uh, are the, what we call the specific variances when I uh, do a sensitivity analysis with the average value and then again with the average value and then added the standard deviation to that or uh, then um, uh, then you see the influence on the available safe egress time uh, on two criterions, the temperature of the smoke layer, 200 degrees Celsius, so that's approximately 2.5 kilowatt per square meter, and the smoke-free height of 2.5 meters. And then you say, well, why, why do you showing us this table? Be no, I'll show you the table because the specific variance uh, with, the with the highest value, that is the most important stochastic boundary condition. And... Um, you can see that's the time constant for fire spread in, in well, in our fire modeling in this case. Uh, so it depends a lot if we have a time constant of 150 seconds or that it is 75 ultra fast or 300 uh, medium fire development. So that's uh, that's really uh, uh, a very uh, dominant uh, stochastic boundary condition. And. Um, well, the goal was to eventually get a graph like this. Uh, what you see in this graph is on the horizontal axis, the available safe egress time in minutes, and uh, the vertical axis, the probability uh, uh, of that available time. This is without sprinkler protection. This is, this is just uh, using the buffer volume in the upper part of the market hall. It's not more than that. Um, and you see here that the available safe egress time is, uh, uh, as an average value, 23 minutes. Uh, so you find that in the graph. Uh, you find that here. And then that means 50% is worse and 50% is better. 
um, uh, with a standard deviation of 9.7 minutes. So that is, that is basically the sense of the sensitivity analysis that we did. To have an idea about available safe times, in this case for evacuation safety, that, that was the set of criterions that are used, uh, in an unsprinkled situation, so this is just uh, at the buffer volume of the smoke layer in this large compartment. Well, then it's nice to see what happens if we add a sprinkler installation into this market hall. Will that mean that the available safe equals time increases or uh, will the available safe time decreases because of effects like you mentioned, eh, for instance, because uh, the stratified situation is not possible anymore and you get a mixed situation and that's more complicated eh, to, to realize then a safe, safe conditions than in a stratified situation. Or does it mean just nothing? <laughs> that's also a possible answer. Um, of course, I'll show you what happens, but maybe in advance, in advance it, it would be nice to have an idea, what, what do you think? Uh, if we add a sprinkler installation is in, in this large and, and also high compartment, uh, what will be the impact on the available safe evacuation time? Who thinks, well, the available safe time increases. It will, it will become better. Okay, yeah. Not sure, not everyone. And, and who thinks, well, it, it will become worse? You think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Nothing, no influence at all. Also, okay, so. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Um, uh, I put in, the, in this market hall a very common uh, uh, sprinkler installation, as you can see. Uh, response, uh, yeah, a quick response installation. That's all. Uh, uh, because if you have a normal response, I think then you lose a lot of time for evacuation. So uh, when you think my, my, my sprinkler installation might be uh, of, uh, of, of any benefit for, for personal safety, then at least you have to use uh, a quick response uh, sprinkler installation. Activation temperature 68 degrees Celsius. Um, and after sprinkler activation, I assume a constant rate of heat release. So that means that the sprinkler doesn't uh, 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 put out the fire, but, but uh, the fire remains under control, under control of the sprinkler installation with a constant rate of heat release. And um, yeah, because uh, sprinkler, sprinkling a fire also means that, that you're a little bit smoldering the fire, not only cooling the fire, but also smoldering the fire. Uh, then uh, I assumed an uh, increase of soot, of the soot yield with a factor two, and an increase of the of the carbon monoxide yield with a factor ten. Um, uh, but uh, I started with a stratified situation remains a stratified situation, and uh, one of my students, uh, Nick Ten Bult, also uh, did some research on uh, on sprinkler influence on smoke layer. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, experiments and uh, simulations in FDS and uh, found that, of course, there is some influence, but that influence is only very localized. Uh, and so most, mostly an influence uh, on the smoke layer where the sprinkler is activated and the smoke bloom. But further away from the, from the fire, you still find that stratified situation. So that's why I start with this, with this assumption. And, uh, well, here you see what happens uh, to, uh, to the available safe evacuation time. Uh, this, um, yeah, this was the graph that we had already before, 23 minutes, 50%. Uh, so this is the non-sprinkler situation. I uh, see that when I sprinkle the fire, then I control the production of smoke. Although I increased the soot yield and I increased the carbon monoxide yield in a stratified situation, that's of no importance because all pollutions are in the hot layer and if the hot layer is not the layer that is important for evacuation, uh, well, uh, then, then increasing the soot yield and increasing the carbon monoxide yield has no influence on safety. So, uh, and the main influence here is that we have uh, a smoke layer that is uh, significantly lower in temperature and also uh, 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 when, well, at, at least when, when um, uh, for, for, for a longer duration, uh, also the, uh, uh, mass flow in the flow smoke layer is much lower than in an unsprinkled situation. 
uh, in a mixed situation, <coughs> it's it's um, it's a bit more difficult. It's a, it's not as good as in a stratified situation, and I think you can imagine that. Uh, so the assessment criterion here is a visibility of five meters and uh, a temperature not higher than uh, 45, no, 100, 100 degrees Celsius. Um, you see uh, again two graphs. Uh, the non-sprinkled graph here in a mixed situation and the graph uh, with the sprinkled situation uh, here. Um, I'm now comparing um, uh, the non-sprinkled situation in the uh, mixed uh, uh, with the sprinkled situation mixed. And your question was, we could have in a non-sprinkled situation a stratified uh, situation and in the, in the sprinkler activation uh, then we could have a mixed situation. And Maybe you remember in the stratified situation uh, the 23 minutes as 50% uh, available safe egress time. Well, that well it looks a bit the same here in a sprinkler situation. So um, in that case, uh, when uh, a stratified situation without sprinkler, uh, when that becomes a mixed situation with sprinkler protection, then you see there is. Uh, basically no influence because uh, the available safe egress time remains more or less equal, although the criteria are completely different. Yeah, so, that's, uh, so that's nice to see. Uh, but in most cases you see that, that there is really a benefit for personal safety in large compartments from the sprinkler uh, protection. Uh, okay, and then the last case might be the most interesting and I think then we also get go a bit to the uh, uh, to the research of, uh, of CIMO. Uh, uh, I did only uh, research based on modeling. Uh, so that means uh, I, I used, in, in all cases, I used uh, CFAST as, uh, as, uh, as zone modeling uh, for, for uh, deter determining the, uh, the available safe equals time. <coughs> and I did that also for this situation. This is a corridor with rooms at, attached to the corridor. And um, so that's rather small compartments, small rooms. And um, well, in that case, we did um, the same uh, uh, the same comparison. Uh, first, we started with evacuation safety in the corridor. That means visibility more than five meters. On this, I think here this should be also a temperature lower than 100 degrees Celsius, but. The temperature is not significant criterion. The visibility is is is, is most uh, important criterion in this case. And what you see here is the left graph is uh, without sprinkler in the fire room, and the right graph is with sprinkler in the fire room. And uh, what does it mean for uh, to, for the for the available safe time in the corridor? Right? So that's outside the sprinkler room. <coughs> it's a little bit disappointing because <laughs> if you look good, you see that uh, well the 50% value five minutes uh, here, also around five minutes, they are pretty much the same. They are not, not really identical, but almost identical. That means that there is no influence of um, uh, the sprinkler protection on evacuation safety in the corridor. But um, the main uh, n n dominant factor is the opening of the door, of the door of the room to the corridor. Uh, and that's one of the stochastic boundary conditions. So I, I thought, well, let's take out that stochastic boundary condition and, and make a fixed time for door opening. After five minutes, we open the door, and the door keeps open for half a minute. Um, and then you see a little bit difference between uh, the available safe time in the corridor in the unsprinkled situation, that's the left graph, and the sprinkled situation, the right graph. Uh, so you see that, that this graph is gives a little, well, only a small advantage of the besprinkler protection compared to this graph. Uh, but um, yeah, but you see also in the sprinkler situation that the corridor is uh, very quickly filled with smoke. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So in the introduction, you briefly uh, touched upon the, the, uh, the fraction of active dose. Yeah. Uh, is this Implicit in the model? Uh, I come to that. I come to that because here the fractional effective dose is not really an issue because the assessment criterion is visibility and temperature, uh, so it's not toxicity in this case. I come to that. I think in the next slide, yeah, 
Uh, what I did here, uh, because I have a very simple fire, I only have a cellulose fire here. So, so uh, uh, the only, the main pollution that I have in case of a smoldered uh, fire is carbon monoxide. So uh, <coughs> in, in my research, I didn't um, apply the fractional effective dose. I just um, set a limit, a threshold value for the carbon monoxide dose at the 35 ppm minutes, 35,000 ppm minutes corresponds to a fractional effective dose of one, yeah. the relative scale. Yeah. So that's <coughs> that's what I did here. And on the assessment, <coughs> sorry, assessment on life safety in the fire room, then you see that there, uh, uh, that means that I would like to survive the fire. Yeah. That then you see that the left graph without sprinkler and the right graph with sprinkler protection, then you see that for life safety, sprinkler uh, uh, is really uh, a pos has really a positive influence. Not not really on evacuation safety in these small rooms, but for life safety, it really has a positive influence. Uh, so that's uh, uh, let's say a factor two or three, something like that. Uh, uh, more available time uh, for uh, to survive the fire compared to uh, the non sprinkled situation. So I came to uh, these, uh, I think, three com conclusions for last compartments. Uh, uh, I think that spring protection uh, increases uh, um, the uh, increases evacuation safety in large compartments, both in a mixed situation and a stratified situation. In small compartments, you see that spring protection does does not really influence evacuation safety, but uh, uh, really increases uh, uh, life safety. Um, uh, the probability of surviving a fire really increases by using a sprinkler protection. And um, if you think about other concepts, uh, uh, that, that was also uh, uh, in the plenary session this morning, when you think about not evacuating anymore, but uh, like something like a stay in place concept, I think then a sprinkler protection is a boundary condition for realizing that concept because that concept means that uh, 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 surviving a fire, the probability is much higher, but also uh, the temperatures are much lower. So are also the overpressure in uh, the fire room is much lower, and that means that also the driving force for smoke propagation is less than without sprinkler protection. Uh, so that means that will be really an advantage <laughs> for you. Thank you. Are you talking, uh, if you're talking about sprinklers, you mean a very localized uh, uh, spray of water or the a dilute system in which uh, no, the complete... No, yes. yeah, okay, right, normal. yeah. <coughs> okay, I give you 10 seconds to stretch a little bit. <laughs> we have quite, we have like 25, to almost 30 minutes still to go. <laughs> okay, so next I will tell you about the research that, that we did uh, in, in Finland. Basically, experiments were done a year ago and then they have been reported in, in the last Interflam and uh, hopefully in some other publications as well. Uh, basically, <coughs> uh, the project started in, in, a, in a way uh, that the availability of existing healthcare center with fairly new sprinkler system, uh, this kind of building came available through a fire officer of the, of the city who knew that, okay, the building is going to be de demolished because there's a new healthcare center right next to it. And, okay, would you like to do some experiments in this building? So, and we had the luxury of having basically a year before the devolishing, so we had a, enough time to prepare for the experimental campaign. The goal of the study was to investigate, indeed, what is the benefit of sprinklers in a building where the occupants cannot, uh, we cannot rely for them to evacuate themselves, to, to egress the building themselves. Uh, we have had this debate in, in Finland for years and almost decades 
about should be sprinkler hospitals or elderly homes or and this type of buildings and in some sense the study is a little bit late that it, it seems that the most of that type of buildings are being sprinkler protected at the moment the the city officers the authorities are requiring that but there is not like a general requirement to do that and and therefore we thought okay it's still worth studying so what we had we had one part of the building basically we used 16 rooms almost identical rooms uh, we did 30 experiments 26 of them sprinklered for free burns uh, it was concrete structure building, three pane uh, windows, uh, mechanical centralized ventilation system, not very strong, didn't play practically any role in this research. The rooms had been e equipped with a uh, residential class sprinkler system. It's not an obvious choice for this type of kind of public building, but it's, it's, it makes sense in a sense that all the rooms that were studied or protected were really small. They were like basically two patient rooms. Uh, they were position, uh, in most rooms they were placed on the wall, like on next to the one, one of the floor, uh, walls. There were usually two nozzles per room. Uh, fast response, 68 degrees uh, and so on. Uh, we basically did four experiments per day, so we had a fire in one corner, had the measurements, did the test, took all the equipment, moved them to the next room, and then the corner of the fire was basically like going around, so it ended up being like a random position of the fire in comparison to the nozzles, okay? We had three different fire loads. 14 sprinkler and two free burns were made using UL1626, which is the acceptance test for the residence or uh, sprinkler systems. So normally this test is being done in a laboratory in, in a very accurately specified manner. This is the place of the fire, this is the place of the nozzles. Here, what's different, the fire load is similar, but it's put in a real room with real sprinkler system and with somewhat random re, uh, distance between them. Okay, then we had two different textile fires using real used hospital textiles, three different types, uh, cotton, polyester and then a flame retardant kind of mixed uh, uh, textiles. Uh, we kind of classified them as small textile and, and large textile fire. Basically it was like a metal trolley with, with different amount of textiles and, and text in, in the larger one they were actually put in plastic bags so it kind of represents like a cleaning trolley or something where you have collected used textiles. Uh, the heat release rates for the UL1626 for fire uh, based on UL experiments we see that the heat release rate goes up to one megawatt in about 670 to 90 seconds so it's something between something very close to ultra fast fire small textile fire went somewhere close to 150 kilowatt larger textile file fire went to one megawatt in again in ultra fast manner this was measured in SPI apparatus and then we had to suppress the fire okay we know the heat release rates we know the, what, what we are burning what we measured we as, as we see the corner of the fire was moving or different but the measurements were always the same we had the thermocouple tree in the center of the room we had the gas sampling location for the uh, uh, FTIR based uh, uh, concentration measurements 
at the height of 80 centimeters. Uh, then we had some plate thermometers and so on. Uh, for the gas analysis, we measured in practice something like 20 different gas species uh, from the room. And we also monitored the sprinkler pipe pressure to make sure that the conditions were all the time consistent with the, with the expected uh, conditions. This is the UL6026 fire on the left. You see uh, uh, sprinkler on the right, free burn. This is accelerated video. Uh, the sprinkler extinguished the fire in three out of 14 completely. Rest of them remained burning at some level. The free burns growth a little bit longer than the sprinkler fire. Sprinklers activated around in average 72 seconds. Free burn would extinguish itself due to the lack of oxygen in, in about two minutes. The activation times we see that in UL62 and the large textile fires, the activation times were very consistent. Not scattering was not huge. In the small textile fire, it took a bit longer, and there was a lot of deviation, obviously, because it was a weaker boundary <coughs> condition or weaker fire. Uh, in terms of temperature, I'm so only showing the results for the UL. The large textile fire was very similar. In the free burn, we see that the height, the second low is ther thermocouple. 2,050 millimeters from the ceiling is basically the height of patient. We see that the temperatures go above 200 during that peak time before self-extinction. In case of sprinkler protection, temperatures remain somewhere below 50 degrees. Okay, clear influence. In that sense, in terms of heat fluxes uh, at, at the patient location in, in, in the UL fire, the peak heat flux average over the all the tests. And in the parentheses, you can see the standard deviation as kilowatts per square meter are the numbers. So in sprinkler situation, 1.4, free burr, 12.3, small textile fire, very low values in both case, large textile fire, 1.9 with sprinkler, and 5.2 in the free burn. Okay, clear effect, uh, obviously hazardous or somehow dangerous would be here if, if the uh, dose of, or, or the duration of the high heat flux is fairly short, so maybe the radiation as such would, have, would not have been a problem in any of these. Okay. This is a free burn of the large textile fire from the corridor. So I like to show videos where firemen fight with doors. <laughs> <laughs> Last year I showed you the video with the fireman trying to open the door from apartment inwards and he couldn't escape. This time the fireman was outside and trying to keep the door closed because the door was opening towards the corridor and there was no sprinkler and the overpressure would have opened that door wide open unless there was this sturdy guy who couldn't really handle it. Okay, so, so we see that the, without sprinkler, the safety of the whole 
part of the building of all the occupants and, and the staff <coughs> members would have been uh, in question. Now, FED. We calculated FED, uh, fractional effective dose values, using three different methods. Uh, according to the ISO standard, which I mentioned before, considers only CO and HCN. Uh, then we also use the Purser's more detailed formulas that you can find from the SFP handbook and, and the fire toxicity textbook and other similar publications. That mm, model also considers nitrogen oxides and um, maybe there was something else. More, it, it also considers more the CO2 uh, and oxygen effects. Okay. And in case of UL, fire, free burn, we see that up to the about 2.5 minutes, the FED values are practically zero, and then they jump somewhere way above one. And regardless, basically regardless of, of how we calculate it. We see that the ISO standard method gives a little bit different, but, but in any case, the conclusion is clear. If you are there beyond this point, you're going to be dead. If we do the calculation in the sprinkler situation, and now this is average data out of 14 tests, and the dashed lines show the uh, um, I think they are 95% confidence limits, if I remember correctly. First of all, we see that three different methods show quite different results. The ISO standard gives us uh, FED of about 0 0.2, no, 0 0.1 here at five, 15 minutes, while the Purser's method give values between 0 0.5 and 1 and the main reason here is that nitrogen oxides are considered and actually it turned out that the nitrogen monoxide is the most uh, important contributor in those equations which is now questionable is it correct or not and, and we can discuss about that. Uh, it, it's use of nitrogen monoxide in Purser's equations is based on the assumption that in high temperature environment nitrogen monoxide will be oxidized into nitrogen dioxide which is very toxic. Uh, but in sprinkler situation there is no high temperature environment and, and how should we do the calculation is a topic of further research. Anyway, we see that the FED values at 15 minute time point is less than one. Now we do the same calculation for textile fires and, and we can look at different thresholds, values 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 1 for each fire type and basically what we see in the large fires, UL16 and large textile fire, the FED criteria are exceeded in several minutes if we uh, or, or increased if we uh, add sprinklers. So in free burns, we it takes maybe two to three minutes for unsafe conditions. With sprinkler, it ranges from four, eight, four, eight, or even eleven. Minutes. Now there's some deviation depending how we calculate and which fire we take a look at. In small textile fire, only the lowest threshold was ever met. For large textile fire, the conclusion is quite similar. Okay, so sprinkler added some minutes to to uh, to to letting us help the person out. But still, the times are quite short if we think about external fire service doing it. They would not be there in eight minutes. 
15 minutes is the finished median time for the time for getting help. Okay. So, the ISO standard defines the, the impact of FED as this kind of function. This is the probability of that individual would be influenced by the FED value or uh, being incapacitated, as we discussed in the beginning. This is the in assumption of, of, the, of the FED method. Then we had our population of experiments. The, we have certain variability in FED values when we did the 14 experiments. If we combine these two uncertainties, we can actually calculate what is the probability of incapacitation of an individual at any given time. And when we do that, again, for the case of UL fire, we see that probability of a person being incapacitated jumps from zero to one somewhere between two and three minutes. Very clear. For sprinkler fire, probability starts from zero and starts to increase somewhere before five minutes and then depending on how we calculate the FED, it will reach something like five percent, few percent incapacitation probability or around 40 percent if we use the Purser's equations. Okay? If we take one minus this, we have the probability of survival. Okay? A few corners cut straight, we can call this probability of survival. And what is the influence of Springer? We see in UL fire, that's what these sprinklers were designed or, or approved by. They were approved using this test fire and we see that they were very effective. They increased the probability of survival from practically zero to somewhere around 60%. Same story in large textile fire. Not, not as clear, but still very similar. In small textile fire, that's the case where we actually see what you mentioned. The spray caused the mixing of the gas layer and at the level of the patient, the toxic gases came down a little bit earlier and in higher concentration. But of course, we see that's qualitatively the effect, but in practice, it's all within the uncertainties because the, in, the patient would have survived even without sprinkler with very high uh, probability. Question yes. What yes. Are the probabilities of those events happening? Probabilities of those events happening. Well, I don't think you will. Like, like, what is the like fr zero. Free frequency of certain fire type or, well, I don't think UL fire would occur <laughs> in the hospital room, uh, <coughs> but that's kind of the reference. Textile fires, of course, the most typical fire class in hospitals would be the patient igniting him or herself in the bed. But then the uh, life safety effect is very, different, it's usually burn injury, and, and it didn't make sense for us to study that. There are a lot of studies about that al already. The second class, when, when we designed the test, we talked with the hospital uh, safety personnel, and this was kind of the second important consideration that somebody ignites the material that is available and that's basically the textiles or plastic cleaning materials and things like that. But all the probabilities are conditional to the occurrence of the fire. So I don't really take a stand what is the likelihood of them. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the conclusions without sprinklers. 
uh, the stronger fires would have caused dangerous conditions in the room in three minutes and they would also they would have put the whole department the whole part of the building at risk with sprinklers they limited the fire in, in all cases in all 26 experiments and 23 percent of those it, it, it fully extinguished the fire uh, they kept temperatures low and prevented the overpressure they increased the available okay this should be actually available safe time yeah. <laughs> now here according to our first slides so with several minutes so the, the time available to rescue the person so basically the rescue possibilities increased from in large fires from zero to, from some low value to somewhere between 60 and 100 percent in small fires the sprinklers did not make very big effect okay this is the conclusion from the test series and now we will continue to the uh, last questions and, and, and final remarks okay we were looking at the safety of people who are not self-reliant how can the personal safety be guaranteed here we were mainly talking about evacuation by external organization like fire service rescue that's where the 15 minutes test time came from or the stay in place concept and or the third option is the evacuation by internal organization in, in hospital this would be the staff members what are your thoughts I'm not going to ask you to raise hands it's not a question like that but 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 how do you have thoughts about these three options like what do you feel about this yes So, so you're commenting the order which should be the first place should be the internal organization okay that's that's probably correct in terms of timeline yes this is a requirement as well in some countries so in the uk it would be a requirement for the the people that are managing the building to take action to safely evacuate the people before okay. the fire service mm -hmm. how many of you think that it's we can reasonably assume that the nurse should go to a room that you saw in the video and rescue a person from there in, in using the white uh, <laughs> skirt yes yeah you, usually there would be smoke alarms it's giving the indi yeah 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 I think yeah. when they are within a minute, mm -hmm. it's, it's safe. Okay, so, so we saw some some kind of indications of time frame that would be safe. If we get, you are saying that if we get very early alarm by smoke alarm, we can tell them that, okay, if there's no sprinkler, you have maybe two or three minutes time to get the patient out. Without, with sprinklers, it could be longer maybe but not much because then the I didn't talk about irritation at all yeah. here yeah okay um, I think it's related to what the question you have in the first place yes where what is life safety and um, like egress is used as a form of tool oh. uh, evacuation is used as a form of tool to to determine life safety and all three is actually related to evacuation but what you presented before was mainly on is and how do you um, have tenable conditions throughout the process such that evacuation does not is not a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically, all personal safety can be guaranteed not through evacuation, but to use of sprinklers in order to make a space tenable, such that you don't really need to evacuate or it's it's not important to evacuate. Okay. Yeah. So. Like, like the second yeah. option in that sense. OK. 
Okay. You want to continue? You're from Finland, and uh, I don't know what the temperature's like today in Finland, but it, it gets quite cold. Um, even in my country, you know, it can, it's certainly wet, like here. Um, if you've got a lot of fragile people, you wouldn't really want to put them out on the street, not very quickly, this, this kind of weather. So you would, you know, ideally you'd like another solution to that, to make that less, less necessary, less likely to be necessary. Well, in, in, in case of fire, maybe still standing a moment in, in, in freezing cold is, of course, better than dying. Than dying but, but, <laughs> Sorry, but obviously. Hospitals, especially in the UK, are designed around the rest of those other evacuation velocities. So yeah, usually you're, you're it's evacuation to the next department, yeah. you, usually, as a, as a first yeah. action. Yeah, yeah you are correct. Right. Yes. Yes, that's true. Okay, we are already over time. Yeah, we are already okay. over time, yeah. So I think we are still one slide left. Uh, I think uh, Simon. Yeah, well, um, we the may, maybe we, sh we skip this and, and go to the overall conclusions. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's okay. Um, well, I think that, um, uh, especially for my research, uh, I think that uh, you can conclude that in large compartments, sprinkler improves evacuation safety um, uh, in, in both a stratified situation as a mixed situation. Uh, in small compartments, uh, you can, well, maybe not egress safety, but at least sprinkler improves life safety. I think that both researches shows that, that there is more time for evacuation, there's more time for rescuing people, and that means that you improve life safety. Uh, so that the probability of surviving a fire uh, until rescued, uh, that probability increases compared to the non-sprinkler situation. And um, when you think about other concepts, uh, not evacuating, but uh, uh, a concept like a stay in place or a defend in place concept, um, then uh, I think that, uh, as I already mentioned, sprinkler could, yeah, sprinkler should be uh, uh, I think a boundary condition to make that concept possible because then you lower the temperature, you lower the overpressure and that means that also smoke propagation to the rest of the building uh, is uh, at least less severe than in a non sprinkler situation and that means that in that case a stay on place concept uh, may, uh, yeah, may be successful. So I think that, that uh, these overall conclusions are conclusions that we can draw from both uh, researchers, uh, very gen generic, very general conclusions, but I think we agree on those conclusions at least. <laughs> and uh, well, I think that's that's it. I put our email addresses uh, below uh, for. Uh, I don't know if they have questions. Well, uh, only questions that doesn't take much time. Then you can email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we conclude the yeah. workshop with this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.